Good morning. A joy to be back here with you. There is a TikToker I love who goes by the handle Jordan the Stallion 8. You might know him for answering questions posed by others in absolutely hilarious ways. Holding his phone up as he films himself in the mirror, he begins his reply. A sentence or two in, though, when he arrives at the main point, he says, come here, and zooms his video in immediately. I appreciated one recent question Jordan took up, given a recent birthday of mine. Where do the 35 to 40-year-old people hang out, someone asked. Jordan responds, see, the one thing people don't understand about this age group is that they don't. <laughs> Come here. Once you reach that age, the top three things you don't like are loud noises, large groups of people, and traffic. <laughs> of all the 12 steps, the penultimate may inspire the most questions. Are you familiar with step 11? We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. So, what is prayer? What is meditation? What is God? What is conscious contact with God? What is God's will? And what does it mean to have the power to carry it out? I could dedicate a year's worth of TikToks and sermons to answering those questions. But I'll simply echo Paula Darcy, whose words reverberate and perhaps encapsulate the broad spiritual wisdom of step 11. Come here. God comes to us disguised as our life. God comes to us disguised as our life. Those words may sound freeing, sparkling with possibility and wonder, or may just add to our already long list of questions. And maybe both are the point. Bill W. intentionally left us without specifics in step 11, urging us to encounter its questions and discern its answers in our own way, just as he encouraged us to define God in our own way. God as we understand God. Though the brilliance of that formulation in steps 11 and 3 frees us from any specific religion or theology, the danger is that it leaves open the possibility of merely substituting our own ego for God. God as we understand God can become a cosmic projection of our own selves. Said another way, we may not perceive the divine as they are, but as we are. Or this poignant example by Anne Lamott, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> the further genius of step 11 is that it frees us from any specific spiritual or religious practice. The danger there is the possibility of becoming trapped in our own thoughts rather than freed from them, and hence mistake our own will for God's will. A total paradigm shift is needed from all or nothing, either or dualistic mind that keep us locked in these same tired cycles of stinking thinking to an emptying of our minds and filling of our hearts instead. Many of us were taught that prayer was something we did when we were otherwise helpless, or as a mere articulation of our private desires, through which we expected God to answer our already determined solutions. God's regular silence and seeming non-answers puzzled us. It's no wonder the whole thing broke down for so many, including me. But through meditation, contemplative forms of prayer, we let go of that limiting lens and limited language and instead simply rest into the reality in which we live and move and have our being, whether we call that reality God or the present moment, knowing this presence or present 
as the only place we can truly experience peace. When we learn to free ourselves of our will, our agenda, our illusions of control over, and finding God's witness, companioning us in love, compelling us on a further journey into wholeness, we're starting to tap into what prayer truly can be. True prayer, says Richard Rohr, is about getting the who right. Who is finally doing the praying? Us or God in us? See, prayer is not something we achieve, but is rather our opting in to an already ongoing and dynamic process of love at work within us. Prayer, then, is not about changing God or changing God's mind at all but being willing to let God change us, praying only, as step 11 says, for the knowledge of God's will. God's will, writes Rabbi Rami Shapiro, is simply what is now, and yet each moment always contains the possibility of more, the possibility of expansive living. When we live expansively, God, like the ocean, when we swim with the current, supports us in ways that allow us to achieve more love in our lives than living any other way possibly could. Finding God's will is finding that current that allows us to live with love. A good way to discern that deeper will is to ask, is love expanding in this moment? Or is it constricting? Is my living contributing to a deeper sense of wholeness for myself and others in the world? Or am I limiting it or fracturing it? Our addictions, whatever form they take, stifle our capacity to love as they obscure its source. Yet our healing of them helps us rediscover our true selves, the source of love at work within us and around us that wills our well-being, the source that wills our becoming co-conspirators with spirit to make God's shalom, God's repair of the whole creation in peace and justice and love, and God's repair of our whole selves, body, mind, heart, and spirit, a reality. I remember the confusion I had the first time I heard the stories of Jesus calling people to follow him, his own version of, come here, and people simply dropping what they were doing, no questions asked, and leaving home, job, family, and the like. But now I sense, just like step 11, that Jesus' invitation hung all kinds of questions in the air. And their going, despite their lack of answers, makes their journey even more instructive and inspiring. Each step of their journey, which would become a step toward greater love and deeper meaning, restored relationships and renewed care for others in committed community. For the four fishermen in the shallow surf of Galilee Sea, Jesus' call comes disguised as their lives and says they'll now fish for people. They'll learn that God's reign excludes no one and is deeply concerned with the wholeness of all, especially those who've been left out, pushed out, and kept out. The particularities of their lives, no longer barriers to their communities, but the pillars which make them strong and more complete. Levi, a Jewish tax collector and co-conspirator with the Roman occupiers of the Holy Land, who tax their subjects with the goal of keeping them impoverished, suddenly leaves his work. Was he addicted to greed, to money, and found diminishing returns on happiness the more he acquired? Was Jesus a mirror held up to Levi's face, showing him what he'd become by taking advantage of others? Come here, he said, as the question hovered before his face. Who might you become instead? Mary of Magdala, Susanna, Joanna, the wife of, Stuart, of Herod's steward, Cusa, each who'd been seen, welcomed, and healed, 
now not only travel with Jesus as disciples, but bankroll the ministry with their own money. Perhaps the question that appeared before them in its own way, how might we use our resources for the repair of the world, for food, for lodging, for hoping somebody, as a colleague of mine's grandma used to say. By the way, Herod Steward Cusa was basically his chief of staff. Lots of money. Cusa's wife, now journeying with Jesus, not only channels some of that money back to the people through Jesus' reconciling recovery work, but also utilizes resources that Herod was employing to snuff Jesus and his movement out. Come here. Perhaps we'll take such creative subversion as our permission slip for some holy troublemaking in this world that sorely needs shaken up. God comes to us disguised as our lives. Two weekends ago, while in New York City for a conference at our sister church, Middle Collegiate, I walked by NYU's campus one evening and saw the encampment constructed there. Jewish students surrounded Muslim students as they prayed, as did people who identified as Christians, people of all faiths, and those unaffiliated, calling for peace, an end to the killing, an end to the kidnapping. One student came around to those on the edge of the encampment with a box of homemade sandwiches which to me seemed both an expression of the nature of their gathering and what they hoped it would be, and a lament for so many without access to their daily bread today. God comes to us disguised as our lives. Two days ago, my mom, dad, and I sat in the canoe, in their canoe, in the middle of a lake. The perfect peace of the morning their silent presence and the lack of fish biting was an experience to me of God's withness. One of the most moving things over the past few years here is to have witnessed the ways you all have become that withness for others here. Ways of mothering our myriad and have a way of midwifing love into our midst over and over and over. God comes to us disguised as our lives, and sometimes we need only pause long enough, still our frantic souls and schedules, to notice the holy shuffling around in the daily events of our lives. Jan Richardson writes that any path with the divine requires us not only to know God, but also to live with our not knowing of God to be present to the vast mystery of the divine who speaks to us in questions more often than in answers. Neither I nor the poets I love have found the keys to the kingdom of prayer, wrote Padre Gotuma. But every morning I sit, sometimes kneel, waiting, making friends with the habit of listening, hoping that I'm being listened to. And there I greet God in my own disorder. I say hello to my chaos, my unmade decisions, my unmade bed, my desire and my trouble. I say hello to distraction and privilege. I greet the day and I greet my beloved and bewildering Jesus who embodies God's presence to me. I recognize and greet my burdens, my luck, my controlled and uncontrollable story. I greet my untold stories, my unfolding story the parts of me that I don't love, and the whole of me which God fully loves. I greet God, and I greet the God who is more God than the God I greet. Come here, one more time. God comes to us disguised as our life. In kind, healing words and loving embraces, in silence, and in fully voiced expressions of solidarity, in thoughtfulness, generosity, creativity, and every act of truth-telling. 
and the planting of each tree and tree in whose shade we will never sit. Each expanding of love in this moment and the next and the next and the next. These become kind of a collective tug on the great question mark until that question mark resembles more of an exclamation point. Conscious contact was made today, whose name is most certainly mystery and most reliably love. Amen.